As engineers, we often only focus on the engineering side. So we look at the calculations, the stresses, where the loads come from. We often overlook the modeling, the drafting, and the building information modeling, specifically BIM. And even as we're going through the ranks, moving up, or even later on, it's something that we can still overlook. The industry has actually realized the benefit of BIM with a lot of countries requiring it in their documentation standards. And even a good BIM modeler can often get paid more than a structural engineer. So let's drill down on the benefits and how you should actually use BIM. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. You see, the true benefits lie in the better coordination, class detection, actually detecting stuff before it comes to site where it'd be more costly to fix. You also get a better presentation and digital twins, which we'll go into later. And do you know where most of the delays happen in projects? On construction sites from miscoordination and missing hazards. And BIM is one of the biggest advantages that you can have to make sure you pick up those hazards before they actually exist and making sure everything's coordinated before it comes to site. But you see, the problem is a lot of people don't want to do a proper BIM model. They see the time ramping up, but this is where you should be bringing up higher and higher and higher because as you peak the top, it will become easier and easier to make changes and making sure none of those clashes and coordination actually occurs. But as the name suggests, BIM is more than just the models and drawings. It's the information that's inputted on it. So you can put additional information to each element. So when people can click on it, they can find a lot more data about that specific element because it's building information modeling, not just building modeling. Yes, it is in 3D, but it also has additional properties attached to each member and what each section means. So you could have additional information about the HVAC units. You could have additional information about the concrete strength, where the reinforcement is, and maybe if some staging, if you're getting into the later stages. There's also two different stages of BIM. You've got open BIM and closed BIM. So what do these mean? You see, open BIM is generally in an open format. So it doesn't matter what program you're running, you should be able to rebuild that model. So it's in a format such as IFC, where you can rebuild it from the information that you currently have. Where closed model is more of a specific format. So you might be doing a Revit model and a Revit BIM model specifically. So it means unless you've got Revit, you can't open it and use the information. So incidentally, if you're using some of these closed methods, what does it actually mean? How can you actually make sure that it's useful for the clients in the future, instead of just specifically for this project when it was delivered? And so sometimes even if you're delivering in a closed space, you may want to deliver it to the client in an open area so they can use it in the future as they need to. And sometimes you have overarching BIM management, which is a software that brings in the Revit model, brings in the Archicad model, might bring in CAD files from the MEP people. But this takes need for having specific BIM modeling agency that manages and processes all this data. On bigger projects, it may be worth it, but on those smaller projects, is it really worth bringing in another consultant? So these are the type of questions you need to ask at the start of the project and how you're gonna manage this project so it's both effective for you, the architect, the other engineers involved, and the client in the long run. There's a couple of terms in BIM modeling that you need to understand. This is both level and LOD. So there's primarily four levels of BIM, starting at zero, and moving all the way to level three. So level zero is probably where I started out in my career and it's what most of my models were doing early on, which is just a 2D CAD drawing. So you have specific plans and elevations that are not necessarily 100% coordinated with the architect, although you probably use it as the base, but it's just the 2D drawing. So there's no 3D cross coordination or clash detection. As you just have plans, it's really hard to detect any of those clashes. You're just really trying to match up drawings and it's up to the builder to make sure the building is built correctly. We move into something a little bit more complicated at level one, which is then moving into a 3D model. So this is typically when you're using Revit. There's very little to minimal coordination. You are using it particularly as a base, but you're building a 3D model. So there's a little bit better on those clash detection. It's a model that you can spin around so the builder has some specific questions. You can show the 3D nature of the location, but there's very minimal coordination at level one. So you're getting slightly better than level zero, but really not that much. So level two BIM is really where the benefits of BIM starts to kick in. So you start to work with the architect. You're coordinating backwards and forwards. You're processing the data from one area to the other. You may be doing this with layers or other aspects. You're not working in the same space yet, but you are making sure that your model is coordinated. So when you're building and drawing something, you may make changes and send it to the architect to update their model. Then they may look at the model and say, you can't do this and send back another change. So you are working semi in the same space, 
the models may be combined at this point, but most of the time you're just working in your own model. So you'll have a structural engineering model and you have an architecture model. And if you're not properly coordinated, sometimes they can diverge from each other as you're not working in the same area. And finally, it's level three. Now this is what we should all be working towards. So it's more than just working in the same space. So level three, you have to be working in the same space. So the architecture is overlaid with the engineering to make sure that it's all cross coordinated. You're putting additional information to that model. So you may have the specific steel grades, the concrete grades. You may have details on the HVAC units and other pieces in the building. So you're really working towards a model that has not only just the specifics about it, but also more detailed integration of information into your model. And you're sharing that collaboratively back and forth. So this is where you need to be really careful, especially moving into level three, is making sure that everyone is working together and who has control of which parts, as you don't want to have an engineer making bespoke changes to the architecture. And likewise, you don't want the architect changing some of the engineering that you've done. LOD is very similar to levels, but it's more refined. They are different in some aspects, as you can have a level two model in different levels of LOD and a level three model in different levels of LOD as well. So it's more way to break down these specific cases of levels of BIM. So what is LOD? It's level of detail. And it ranges from 100 to 500 at the top end. Now, most people don't go all the way to the 500, but it's good to understand which level it is at. As in the long run, that's probably where we wanna be going but we can progress through it slowly as it's more expensive to do an LOD 500 model than it is an LOD 100 model. So LOD 100 is very much like your basic level of BIM. You probably have some dimension details on there, but you just have minimal amounts of definitions on that model. So as minimal as you can have. So typically you probably see this in the 2D phase where you just got plans and dimensions and details or elevations. So there's very little information in an LOD 100 model. And this is probably where I started out my career is doing LOD 100 models as in those cheaper areas, you potentially don't need to go any further. LOD 200, you start to have things such as quantities, the number of elements, how many beams of this type do you have? So you're getting a little bit more information into the model that helps quantity surveyors cost out the price of the project. But it's only really about size, shape, and quantity. You're lacking specific details into each element in that project. LOD 300 is moving into more bespoke information. You've got size, location, orientations of specific elements. You may even be going down into the what the connections are. So how many bolts do you have in each connection? Where are they located? So it has a little bit more information in level two, and you can see what the interface is and how the connections are looking. But you may not be modeling it specifically. It may just be a note on the drawings or details that people can draw out. So it allows the quantity surveyor to price it a lot better as it does have a lot more information. But you may not actually have the 3D components that you're looking for. And as we're going up through these stages, these become exponentially and exponentially harder to do as you need more and more information in your model. Now, LOD 400 is really where we start to get a lot more information into the model. So it becomes more complex and you need to have more details. So the model is getting more and more precise as we're moving up through the level of details. It means that you have to have a more accurate model. In LOD 100, where you can be plus or minus a couple of 10, 20 mils or more, you're really getting down to the plus or minus a couple of millimeters here to making sure that it's accurately and you can quickly detect any errors or clashes that you may have. And it has specific accurate information about individual elements. You're really going into the connections, the finishes, the fabrication methods, and potentially even the erection methods on how the building comes to site. You even have even bespoke information like how the parts come to site, how they're erected and fabricated, and maybe even some of the temporary conditions so that you can have all the information that Bidil that potentially needs just in that one specific element. So this is where you've got all the information of if the building is perfect, how it comes together, and how you actually put each component in its location. So this is really the peak of the area where your model gets delivered. So typically just before it gets constructed is when this gets shipped out. As you have a really detailed model, LOD 500 is really where digital twins come in. As this is where you need to have as built data. As we know with any site, things need to change as they come to site. So you need to update your model as these changes occur. At LOD 500, you're really looking at where each component is, how they're fabricated, and any changes that may have occurred on site. So that means when this model is over, it's the as-built conditions. So how was the building actually built as opposed to how was it originally documented? In this LED 500 as well, you'd also have information about how to maintain elements. What is operation manuals of specific elements in your building? Any maintenance and other data as well. So again, as we were saying before, between open and closed BIM, if this is a closed environment, over time, that information will be lost. So if you're doing an LED 500 model, you wanna make sure sure that people in the future can access it. So looking towards those open BIM methods 
is the better location if you're going to spend the time to do an LED 500 model. So LED is really important to define at the start of the project. How much clarity do you need? How much is the builder going to use it? And how much is the client going to use it? Is it actually worth spending all that money to go to an LED 500 model? Are they going to use it in a residential project? Maybe not. But in a big casino such as Queen's Wharf, it becomes more beneficial as the people that are using it will gain additional benefit from having an as-built constructed BIM model that they can use as maintenance and repair regimes. And even looking at where I need to find something, they have a model, they don't need to go digging around. They can just look at the model and find out where the specific components are. And so when you're doing any collaboration with your architect, engineer, MEP consultants, is making sure that you have clarity on the LOD that you're gonna be delivering. As you don't want people delivering different levels of LOD that can lead to a mess in the final delivery of the project. And the LOD is clear that if you go the higher levels, you're more likely to have less problems with clashes and other things occurring on site that may have been missed. If you've got a big project that's crucial for delays, increasing your LOD will have benefits on that project as you'll detect them before they come to site where it's gonna be more costly. But now we've just talked about BIM modeling, different levels of detail, but what is Digital Twins? Surely it falls into one of these circumstances. Well, actually Digital Twins is almost another step again. It may be a different level of LOD, but Digital Twins is like having a model from the real world in the digital space. You also have additional things like sensors and other components to the building, so you can have real-time monitoring. So you can have feedback backwards and forwards, detect when things are going wrong. Actually have a way of assessing if the structure went this way, what does it actually mean? So if you have an earthquake and you've detected how big that earthquake is, how can you move back into the building? Is it actually safe to do so? Or potentially even having detection on such things as the HVAC unit and detect that something's going wrong before it's too late and repair it when it's early. As through these monitoring systems, you're modeling the digital space from real world conditions and updating it from these real world sensors. So it's about maintaining, not just doing the construction phase for a digital twin, as you will need to potentially update it for the as-built conditions, but also collaboratively through the whole life of the building between maintenance regimes, repairs, upgrades. So changes over time to that structure in the real world, then updating it in the digital space to making sure that you're maintaining that digital twin. You see a lot of time, especially with insurance, people want to know how the building's behaving and where the information's coming from. So if you've got a digital twin attached to your residential building, potentially have the chance of reducing the cost of insurance. As the insurance company has more confidence in the maintenance of your building and how it's actually performing and catching things early when it's cheaper to do so instead of when it's too late. It also allows for better decision-making as you have more clarity on how the building's actually performing over time and you can improve it in future builds as well. Hopefully this giving a little bit of insight and in how BIM modeling can help improve your projects. But if you want a simple rule about structural engineering that'll help improve your designs even further, I've got a link to a video here. And if you're interested in supporting your channel, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the supports on my YouTube or Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. Keep learning and I'll see you next week. Bye.